Many of us have been told at some time in our life not to talk to strangers. I get that. Strangers can be annoying, they can be frustrating, and they can be possibly even dangerous. But I'm here to tell you, after spending most of my life living in other people's cultures and countries, that talking to strangers is not only unavoidable for businesses that want to succeed or communities that want to grow, but it can be interesting and even essential to who we are as human beings. I'm also going to share with you a conceptual model that I use when I encounter strangeness in, in other people. By strangers, I don't mean the people that you sit with in the airplane or you see across a dimly lit bar. There's websites devoted to introducing you to those people. <laughs> I'm not talking about the people at, the, uh, at work or at, um, at a cocktail party that you want to get to know. You can take courses on how to do that. I'm talking about the strangers who we don't want to talk about, that we don't want to talk to. People from a different religion, people from a different culture, uh, different orientation, different social and economic class. The people that make us uneasy. These people challenge the way we view the world. They challenge some of our deeper assumptions. So what is it about people like that? Or, for example, a woman wearing a hijab, a gay couple wanting to get married. Why do we find a woman wearing a hijab so threatening? Why does it get us so fired up? Or the gay couple wanting to get married. Why do some people feel it's going to affect their heterosexual marriage, that it's going to attack family values? Well, I think it's because Strangers challenge some of our deeper assumptions, the things we don't usually think about that formulate our way of looking at the world. And they challenge us to think again. Richard Kearney uh, writes, strangers represent experiences of extremity which bring us to the edge. They subvert our established categories and challenge us to think again. So when we meet a stranger, we can blame them for the strangeness, or we can ask ourselves, why do we find it strange? And I think in a world that's increasingly interconnected, we can't avoid not to talk to strangers. We can't afford to say they're evil, that they're not human, and attack them. We have to engage with them to do business and to grow our communities. And by doing so, I think we will find out more about who we are as a human being. I think the best way to understand why this works is this metaphor perhaps overused, but let's use it again, the iceberg of human experience or human behavior. What you see, the behavior and the artifacts, the things people do and the things they do it with, that's the easy stuff. That's the language, the food, the four Ds as it were, dinner, dance, dress, and dialogue. The extent of much of our multiculturalism here in Canada. Below the surface, what we don't see are the beliefs and values. And even deeper than that, the assumptions about how the world works. We spend our time looking at the top, um, and we don't see what gives rise to that behavior. The beha beliefs and values and assumptions give rise to what we do. I remember a time uh, when I was working in Yemen, one of my first trips over there, I was trying to find uh, Yemeni Airlines flying from Dubai to, to Sana'a, and uh, I, there was no signage, I was looking for the to check in, and I was looking down each row, and I saw a, a big crowd of uh, women all dressed in black, head to toe. I said, that's probably Yemen. So I went there, and sure enough, it was. And I, I kind of felt sorry for the women there. I thought, nah, they're kind of oppressed, maybe a bit uh, backwards. That was my impression, because in my culture, given my beliefs and values and assumptions, a woman wouldn't wear an outfit like that when it's 45 degrees centigrade outside. That's 100 plus for people down south. So I made those judgments about them. Well, spent some time, quite a bit of time there. I got to know some of these women. I worked with them in Sanaa. And I asked them about the, the hijab. And they said, well, that's because it's in the Quran. And I said, oh, yeah, where is it? And they showed me the passage. It said, the wives of Muhammad must dress modestly. So we are dressing modestly. I said, OK, it's part of a religious practice. I could understand that. As I got to know them a little bit better, they said, well, you know, the other thing is, you don't have to worry about your hair in the morning just because it's covered anyway. I thought, smart. And I got to know them even better, and after a couple of years, one of them took me aside. He says, well, you have no idea what many men are like. You do not want them paying attention to you. 
So I thought, now I could see that wearing a veil, head to toe, all in black, with black gloves and black socks, was maybe not something that I would endorse, doesn't make sense in my uh, worldview, but it wasn't strange. It wasn't uh, ir irrational at all. In fact, it has a lot of benefits to it, and I could at least appreciate that. The same iceberg approach could be used to look at business. Look at businesses who charge through the oceans of, of uh, different countries, and they come up with all of their contracts and their marketing plans. They look at the language, the top of the iceberg, yeah, we can translate our stuff into English or into, from English into whatever language we need to. We'll make a contract and we'll make them sign a contract. And then we go storming through there, full of ourselves, full of certainty that our scientific approach to business is going to work. Well, that kind of reminds me of another scientific endeavor that didn't go very well. The unsinkable ocean liner, the Titanic, went storming through the Atlantic. And what part of the iceberg sunk the unsinkable ocean liner? It was the bottom part. It wasn't the top. It was the bottom part that ripped a hole through all seven airtight chambers of the, uh, of the uh, ocean liner and it sank. Well, I think the same thing can happen to us in going into other cultures. Like it happened to me, um, making assumptions about these women dressed in black, like businesses who charge overseas and get scuppered on things that they don't see. Um, perhaps an example you might remember, Alexei Yashin, anybody remember him? He used to play for the senators in the late 90s. He had a contract dispute with the uh, senators he was getting paid three and a half so a million dollars a year to play hockey. I got into the wrong business, had I only known. <laughs> they, um, at that time, Steve Yeiserman and I think Flurry was getting like seven million dollars a year. And so Yashin went to the senators and said, well, I'm as good as them. And they said, oh yeah, definitely, maybe better. Um, I want seven million. They said, well, you've signed a contract, it's three years. At the end of the contract, we'll pay you out, we'll, you know, we'll um, up your salary and make it market level. He said, no, no, that's not fair because I'm worth more. And the senator said, well, that's not fair. You've signed a contract. Yashin said, that's not fair. I'm worth more. And it unearthed a really interesting difference between that, what's contract mean? We thought we had a contract signed. For yet, in, a, in many cultures, and especially in Russia, contracts change. They evolve. And it's nothing to rewrite a contract. For us, sign a contract. It doesn't matter what happens. It's going to be thing. So we didn't think about that. We thought we had the contract. Our, we had this little artifact, but the beliefs and values that went underneath that, we didn't get. Now, before we get too far into thinking about culture as determining behavior, I want to explore a little idea with you that we're, we're like every other human being in our physiological needs. We need to eat and sleep, in our need for security and love and belonging. Anybody recognize what's happening? Maslow's hierarchy of needs, self-esteem, self-actualization. Every human needs that. Every human wants that. How we get that, however, is a product of our culture. Culture is the strategy we use to get what we need. So, for example, we need to eat. Some of us use chopsticks, some of us use knives and forks, some of us use our hand with a chapati. Um, different strategies, same end. How do we get love and belonging? Well, that differs a lot. That's one thing I found. Uh, high power distance cultures, you talk to people, use their, their title, their, um, uh, their last name. Low power distance cultures, you'd use the first name. My son calls me up just the other day. He says, hey, fat boy, lay off the cookies. <laughs> I don't know, really? <laughs> but he, he, he's, he lives in Toronto now. <laughs> Maybe you learned that. Um, I think that's a way of, for him, that's showing that we belong. That's, that's reaffirming our relationship. If he calls me up, as he has, and it says, Dad, okay, <laughs> how much? <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a problem when he uses my title because he's going to appeal to that, that role. But the interesting thing about my son, he's half Iranian. Now, he lives a few miles away from his Iranian uh, grandparents. Let him try, hey, fat boy, lay off the cookies with his grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> no, in that culture, you, you say, pedar jun, aga jun, father dearest. If you tried father dearest with me, I don't know, I'd, I'd get really, really worried. What had he done? But let's take a look deeper at culture. We have our ethnic culture. How much of me being a Canadian does that determine my behavior? 
I got a request the other day from one of our hospitals and they said, uh, why don't you come over and do a lunch and learn on how Vietnamese view hospitalization? And I said, okay, that sounds cool. But first tell me, how do Canadians view hospitalization? Oh, um, what do you mean, are the young or old, rural or urban, um, educated or not? And I said, exactly. Vietnamese are just as diverse. And we often think that, you know, we in Canada, we're so multicultural, but other people have culture. But one of the things I hope you take away from today is we all have culture. And it's a bit um, inefficient, dysfunctional, I won't put any other words on that, to think that we somehow have reality and other people have culture. Our professional training conditions how we view the world, whether we're doctors, nurses, uh, accountants, engineers. We learn to think about problems and, 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 and approach things in different ways based on our professional training. Our gender, male or female, we have different ways of communicating, different ways of constructing social relationships. Many years ago uh, in the 80s, Deborah Tannen wrote this great book called You Just Don't Understand. And the other guys in the audience know that they've heard that before because we communicate very differently between men and women. Language. Interesting thing about language, we think, uh, we get this from the healthcare system, well, just translate those terms and we can use them, as if language is just different words for the same thing. It's not. Language is how we express ourselves. It's how we construct questions and how we signal, how we mirror um, concern. These things are very different between cultures. I worked with a, with a guy in, uh, in Yemen, in the oil patch, and I was really impressed with this guy. He had taken it on the chin for the company, uh, knew all the rules. Um, I relied on him to understand much of this, how this Canadian company in the desert worked, and I'm gonna call him Nasser. Um, uh, HR manager position comes open, and I said to the vice president, Nasser's your man. He's, you know, he's been here, he's proven his loyalty. And the vice president said something really interesting he, to me anyway. He said, yeah, Nasser, bright guy, but he just doesn't get it. And I thought, well, what doesn't he just not get? And I had uh, interviewed him, and so I went back and looked at the tape, or listened to the tapes, and it was, it was true enough. Nasser was thinking in Arabic, but speaking in English. And when you speak in Arabic, you are very emotional. You repeat yourself. It's a rhetorical strategy. In English, that sounds like you're being a bore and being pushy. And so, while he had all the knowledge, he was using a different language strategy, a rhetorical strategy, that he had picked up in his first language to speak in English, and we didn't trust him. And that kind of launched uh, some further research that I did. Also, experience. Um, if you spent your whole life being discriminated against because of your orientation, being discriminated against because of your skin color, or your ability, you, it's called minority stress, you learn to expect it. You learn to anticipate that. You see it when people look at you when they, when they don't look you in the eye. And so what happens, you come into a hospital, you're already in a defensive mood. You're already not trusting that person, independent of what the physician or the nurse or the, the receptionist at the company is, um, is doing. So experience conditions how we do things as well. So everybody is not just their ethnic culture. They're not just from Colombia. They're a professional, they're a man or woman, they have, they have experiences, and you have to understand all of that part to understand that person. If we somehow think that just because they're Colombian or Canadian that they're gonna do something, I don't think that's gonna work really well. And on top of all that, of course, we're individuals. We're extroverted, introverted, sensing, intuitive, thinking, feeling, judging, perceiving, anybody recognize that? Myers-Briggs. I don't, for those of you who are familiar with it, I don't think it'll be a surprise for me to tell you that I'm ENFP, which conditions the way I do being a guy, which conditions how I do uh, getting love and belonging. So, and the interesting thing though, is we change. We're not programmed. So I can play rec hockey. How do I get love and belonging on a hockey team? <laughs> well, you swear a lot, you spit, take a few penalties, that's cool. Um, but then I go to work, and then we'll go to show up at work, and I see my uh, cubicle uh, neighbor, and I say, how the <clears throat> are you there, and spit, and check her into the cubicle. <laughs> What's gonna... I don't do that, because it's a different situation, it's a different culture. Everybody is the same. 
the people who just come from other cultures, they are just as flexible as you are in understanding that, that the situation may require new things. But we as Canadians often say, oh, we're multicultural. You can keep your culture, which we mean keep the three or four Ds, but we don't mean keep those beliefs and values about how to obey the law and how to, what's transparency, what's accountability. Those things we're quite, we're, we're quite certain about. So I suggest to you that culture then is like a patchwork. It's a bunch of codes that we drink. It's not just our ethnicity. It's our professional training. It's the stories we heard as we were growing up. And so I suggest to you a definition of culture that it is the shreds and patches of narratives that we draw upon to make sense of the world. When you encounter something, you think of what kind of story goes on, what explains me and my situation here, and you draw upon that to make sense of it. If culture then is the shreds and patches of narratives, it can change and it's very fluid and you can take on new stories and that's what happens when people have a trauma. When you have someone's a traumatic experience, you help them reframe it from a negative to a positive to a life enhancing, life furthering narrative. Cultural sensitivity then is not about saying, oh, we have to accommodate whatever someone from another culture asks us, because of course you could realize that in the healthcare system that could be really, really difficult. We have 200 ethnic groups here in Alberta, and how many different ideas about how to treat certain illnesses? Do we just say, oh, okay, we'll do whatever you want if we're cultural sensitive? No. We say, here's our story. Here's how I understand this. How do you understand that? And we negotiate a common ground. So that's what I want to leave you with. When you encounter strangeness, when you encounter some kind of behavior that may not make sense to you or may disturb you, wait. Don't pass judgment. Wonder about what kind of assumptions or values give rise to that behavior. And engage that person in a storytelling exercise. Create a safe place. You have to appreciate that everybody must make sense of this uh, occasion. They can't just rely upon you as to give them all the answers, because nobody will do that. They have to hook it into their system. Um, steal one story from, from my healthcare uh, time. Uh, we had a, a guy uh, admitted to hospital with an acute uh, chest pains. It turns out he needed er emergency surgery. And we gave him the consent form. To, he says, no, I can't, I'm Muslim. And it just took everybody's breath away, like the guy's in desperate need, and we didn't know what to do. And um, and so they sent in the youngest person on the team, a social worker had just been hired, and she just chatted with this guy for an hour and a half about his family, about his trip here, and, and she said, well, you know, I gotta go. Uh, good luck uh, with, uh, with the time in the hospital. And, he, and uh, as she left, he said, oh, uh, on your way out, would you give me the consent form? I'm ready to sign it now. She didn't explain the thing. She created a safe environment for him to think through what was happening. And this is what we need to do. People will often bring out barriers saying, no, I can't because of this. That's an invitation to say, I need to talk about this more. I have to understand how this fits with the way I understand the world. And this is what we need to do with strangers. Give them that safe place. Share your story. You have a culture. Canada has a phenomenal culture. Your personal life and all the, the narratives and experiences that you draw upon, very interesting. In fact, you often signal that. When we meet after here and we chat over a, a, a good cappuccino, you're going to signal a lot of those things subconsciously to me. I'm going to pick up on them. Um, we have to do it perhaps more explicitly with people from different places. But share your story. You have one. and You have a, one that's very important for them to understand you. And we're, together then we negotiate a common story. Often in Canada, what's the most... How do we meet somebody? The first thing we do, we say... Uh, Gee, well, if you have a uh, different skin color or a different name like I do, they say, uh, oh, hi, Helgi, where's that from? And what's that a question of? Is that trying to out me? Is that trying to make me different from them? No, I think in Canada, that's a request. Tell me your story. Helgi, where does a guy get a name like Helgi? I was born in Iceland. My father wanted me to remember that. So... <laughs> So he named me after Helgi Margre, who was able to jump further backwards with all his armor on than anyone else in the country. <laughs> My dad thought that was a good thing to leave me with. <laughs> so when someone asks you where you're from, or where do you get that name, share that story, because that's an invitation to understand your world so that they can participate in it. 
So then talking to strangers then is a way to more fully understand ourselves and understand what it means to be human.